which kind of raises the question, you know, what should democracy look like? Um, it should be direct. Decisions are made directly by people. Power remains in the hands of the people themselves. Uh, it should be participatory, structured for involvement of everyone. All can participate in matters of common life and influence those matters. Uh, it should be deliberative. Decisions emerge from emerge from processes of discussion and consensus building rather than merely the results of formal proceduralism where we are tallied as isolated voters. It should be radical. Democratic principles should are expanded into all spheres of life, not just what we know as government today, but also into economic planning, production, distribution, as well as housing, stewardship over environment, etc. And it should be revolutionary. Democracy should in its, is in itself a process of social transformation where the power of people sets out on a collision course with the privileges of the elites, where the foundations of the old system are consciously uprooted and a new system is created into the social reality, right? So I think it, th those are all really good ways to kind of evaluate our democracy, right? Um, you know, direct, how direct? Uh, you know, what if we're talking about representative democracy, um, you know, how is how much control do people have? How, how is, you know, where is members, where are voters, what is our, our power of recall, things like that. Um, you know, it should be participatory. How much, how much do people actually uh, engage, right? In the, you, in the United States, our electoral system is not very direct and it does not encourage participation. Um, we have other countries, I, I think Australia mandates voting. I could, I, I'm pretty sure they, that's who I'm thinking of that does. But we have some countries that mandate voting. You find if you don't. Right, um, but that doesn't mean that you have a participatory system, and that means you have a mandatory system, right? It, it's not just the act of voting um, that determines whether or not you participate in democracy. It, it's we're talking about local, you know, communal councils and boards and and every act of civic engagement. That's partly why we include the next principle of deliberative: that it's not enough for people to just go vote; they've got to be able to. Um, participate not only by um, voting or kind of expressing their opinions or whatever, but that their opinions are actually taken into account as part of the process, a consensus building process that will actually influence the end result. Yeah. And, and when you look at what we do now, it's just majority rule, right? And majority rule sets up for a large unhappy minority, um, especially when it's just bulldozed through, right? Um, Bulldozing through is something the Republicans have shown very good at and the Democrats have shown unwilling to do, right? And when we're looking at the effects of that now, right? Um, you know, Roe versus Wade has been dropped in multiple chances to enshrine Roe in law instead of in precedent were passed up uh, by the Democratic Party, you know? So just the ability to pass something is not, is not in and of itself mean that it is Democratic or that it re represents, you know, a, a large group of people. So, <clears throat> you know, it's it's important to, you know, even if it's not consensus, right? We, I'm sure we could have a, a long debate amongst people on the left about consensus. I'm sure Garrett and I could have a long debate amongst each other about consensus. Um, and I would say we, but we are both pro-consensus people. But um, even if we're not talking about, you know, orthodox consensus right the process needs to be deliberative so that people's concerns are heard not only heard but addressed right um it shouldn't be well if we got 51 percent, we don't care um that that creates someone who's not happy within their society especially you know when you look at i mean just look at the united states it, this is the direct outcome of of majority rule you know and non-participatory non-direct non-radical non-revolutionary <laughs> politics Fli uh, flipping between presidents that each get 51 percent of the vote so so half the country is always angry yeah yeah um you know it's i and the idea of expanding democracy into all spheres of life is incredibly radical right um and it's necessary this is when we talk about economic democracy, when we talk about when we talk about socialism, right? Worker ownership. We're talking about expanding democracy outside of just the electoral system, which in the United States isn't democratic at all, right? Um, but the same when you look at our economic sphere, right? We don't have a, a democratic economic system, right? We have a, a, a system, of an incredibly hierarchical capitalist system, right? That 
is so powerful that it even influences our political system uh, most of the time. And so one of the most radical things we can do is spread democracy throughout our lives, not just, you know, talking about democracy as in voting and electoralism, but democracy in our workplace, democracy in our community, um, democracy in our neighborhoods, right? Yeah. Community assemblies and, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, any any, any place really that there needs to be uh, decision-making, you know, beyond, I guess, very simple things in your personal life, we should think about how we can democratize that process. Um, and so that's beyond, you know, traditional government and voting and things. And that's also beyond the traditional kind of union focus on workplaces. There's a lot of things that go into our communities where uh, we need to have this participatory deliberative structure that tries to get as many people involved in that process as possible. You know, not everyone works in the same workplace. You, you can't focus only on unions. Um, and, um, you know, government as it exists today, it doesn't necessarily... Uh, in fact, it puts way too much into the market and things like that. It doesn't actually oversee a lot of this stuff. It leaves the decisions to wealthy people is essentially what leaving it to the market means. So instead of having that process, we want to have this uh, participatory process that includes everyone in the community in making that decision as opposed to leaving it to wealthy people um, or you know, it, political insiders and things like that. Um, and just to kind of point... Uh, throw in a point there on uh, what Chris said about consensus and all. Um, I think one thing to try to avoid that sort of debate here is um, a lot of folks confuse consensus with unanimous. Unanimous meaning that everyone has to agree. And um, consensus is not necessarily unanimous. It could be, and, and it, in certain decisions, maybe it should even be. Uh, but consensus is really the process. It's not really that outcome. Um, the outcome of a consensus process could be unanimous. Uh, everyone agrees. The outcome could be a vote. It could be a majority vote or um, a supermajority vote of 60 or 70 percent or whatever it is. The point, important point about consensus is that it's this deliberative process where everyone is getting together, discussing their concerns, their issues. They're being heard. They're being evaluated by all the membership, and uh, you're working your way through that decision-making process to try to deal with as many problems as you possibly can, to deal with as many concerns as you can, uh, because that's what participatory means, right? Having everyone involved, hearing all those concerns, and trying to uh, address all of them in, in a fair, just, equitable way, all, you know, all of those things. Yeah, and a good example kind of how to think about you know, decentralized democracy, but still understanding, you know, the need for coordination and, and a level of, of centralized planning would be healthcare, right? Um, if we were to just, if we were to implement the Medicare for all that progressive Democrats want, right, all alone, just open the rolls, let everyone in on Medicare. Um, I, I, and I would imagine that even if they could get that passed, it would contain caveats that uh, private insurance gets to survive, right? Um, whereas, you know, a true single payer system would end private insurance as well. Um, you know, for most even, things, but, even in the best case scenario that they like eliminated private insurance or whatever it is, the you public still have options the, the best they're ever going to get. You still have the problem of uh, private for profit hospitals and doctor's offices and pharmaceuticals and all these things. So, we, we that's part of the democratization process of asking how do we make the hospitals more democratic? Uh, and accountable to their communities. How do we make pharmaceuticals? There's important life-saving drugs, insulin and things that need to be made. How do we make that in our community in an accountable way and not necessarily the billionaires or whatever owning it or political elites and things like that? Um, yeah. so, sorry, uh, go ahead with Medicare. Yeah, for all. <laughs> yeah right. And so if, if we just get the public option, right, which like would be game changing for millions of people, right? So we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't shit on that too much. Um, but it essentially will be a feeding trough for these for-profit companies like private hospitals, private providers, private man medical manufacturers, the pharmaceutical company, right? Companies, right? It, it'll be a slush fund that they can just pull from because, and because we won't have removed, right? The profit motive from the entire sector. Much like we can't, you know, implement decentralization solely at the local level, we can't implement, you know, public health care solely at the level of insurance and payment. We need to, you know, socialize the pharmaceutical industry. We need to implement a, a national health service uh, where providers and medical manufacturers and things like that are all brought under social control. Um, 
But even if we did that, right, through the most radical of, you know, things that we've seen through, you know, from progressive Democrats or looking at, you know, England and their National Health Service, it still ran top down, right? A budget is passed at the top level. It is di distributed amongst people, amongst the different, you know, regions, and then they get to do what they can with it. Um, you know, when we're talking about decentralized, bottom-up, community-controlled and health, uh, national health service, which is what we, uh, in the 2020 campaign, called for, what we called for was local health boards that were made up of community members, that were made up of the doctors and the nurses and the, you know, the work, the frontline worker, the front, you know, line workers at the actual uh, providers themselves, and that instead of doing what they could with a budget, they would send a budget of what they needed. And the responsibility of the, the legislature was to provide the funding that was necessary, right? And then at the local level, they can address like, where do we have shortfalls? Where do we, I live in a medical district. I can literally see two hospitals from my house, right? Why are they right next to each other when there's whole areas of town that don't have coverage? Um, you know, why, and, and same thing with, you know, smaller providers that aren't hospitals, they're all, grouped around the hospitals, they're grouped around in the more wealthy white area of town, right? Leaving most of the working class and most of the people of color in town with limited access. Um, and so when we bring in community control, when we reverse the flow of power from coming down, you know, top down to going bottom up, um, you know, it is a revolutionary thing that can completely change the game for us.